Plasticity. Yes. We will talk about plasticity. We have been talking about it. So, with understanding plasticity, we are going to understand how material is performing reversibly. Okay. So, most of the time we will be considering metallic materials deformation. For polymers and ceramics and very brittle materials, these concepts are still true. Okay. And many times you will see that in literature people have applied the same concept which is derived for metallic materials is used for polymers also. What does that mean? It means that the theory which we are trying, trying to understand is called continuum plasticity theory. Okay? And the, this theory is not dependent on the mechanism by which the plasticity happens in the material. So before we go there, let us look at a stress strain diagram and we have seen a few types of stress strain diagram. So you can have an ideal plastic behavior which is not seen in metals or materials and mostly we'll, we see something which gets strain hardened and then it reaches a maximum and drop when we plot engineering stress and engineering strain. So, so you should know the difference between engineering strain and true strain and engineering stress and true stress. Okay. So engineering strain is not associated, you can't add it. And uh, so for example, if you have a bar like this and this gets extended and then you find out the engineering strain will be what? Delta L by L, right? So if you divide it in three pieces and then calculate engineering strain for these three pieces and add them together, you will not get the total strain, okay? You will not, you should try this and see. So for example, the initial length for each of these elements will be L by three, okay? And in each element you will have a delta L of L by 3, it may not be delta L by 3, okay? So what will be this? This will be delta L by 3 divided by L by 3. So you are getting the same amount of strain in all three components, okay? But in, in reality if you add them you will not get the total strain. But logarithmic strain you can add that is associated, okay? So, true strain, which is this, which is equal to this. That you can add, that is associated, okay? So how do we get these two relationships, delta L by L is equal to A naught by F, by assuming this to be constant volume, right? So, so then you can also derive the relationship between this and that. Can you do that? This was an assignment. Yeah? So that you can easily do. And um, what, what, yeah. So the assumption is that there is a constant volume. So tell me in which region this assumption of constant volume is true, it's valid. No. What about elastic behavior? Is it true there? No. no? Why? Because there is only can you see? So can you see? Can you not? So can you see speed means size scale? Size will be seen. Yeah. Size will also increase in plasticity. But what is the important? So in elasticity, again coming to the same question, in elasticity what, what will happen to volume, will it change? This we have discussed, huh? Volume. 
volume changes because we don't have volume ratio equal to 0.5. Yes, sir. Right? So that is yeah. okay. And in the last class, we discussed that plasticity may not begin beyond this. It may begin even before. Okay. <coughs> so the total strain we can write it as a combination of elastic and plastic strain. Right? And when I'm doing that, I'm doing, so I'm assuming it to be two strain. Okay, this is not engineering strain. So elastic strain, I can write as this. And plastic strain, I can write as some coefficient into strain to the power some exponent. And this is plastic. Okay. So this part, I can write it as some coefficient of elastic strain into sigma by sigma naught to the power n minus 1, where sigma naught is the yield strength of the material. Now, if you put sigma is equal to sigma naught in this equation, what will you get? If I say that now I have reached that point, exactly that point, then the total strain is sigma naught by E plus alpha into sigma naught by E. That's it, right? So this is equal to 1 plus alpha into sigma naught by E. So you see I am getting some extra strain apart from elasticity. Right? For that amount of stress I should have only this much amount of elastic strain but I am getting something extra and that extra is plastic strain so it means that there is always some amount of plastic strain in the material. <clears throat> and usually what engineers do is because we take 0.2% proof stress, right? So this part of the strain must be equal to, or the total must be equal to 0 0.002 because that's what we are doing, right? Or no? Is it correct or not? So let us say it is intersecting here and then I drop a line there. Okay. So some part must be recovered. Some part will remain. That part is plastic. At how much is that part? That part is 20. Because I'm drawing parallel, right? It's not that this point is 0 0.002. I'm not drawing vertical line. Okay? So wherever this line intersects, if you drop a perpendicular, from that, something will get back. Whatever remains is 0.2%. Okay? So only plastic part, only this part is equal to 0 0.002. And from that you can calculate the value of alpha and you can write this equation. <coughs> right? So what, what does it mean? So for whatever is the value of alpha, if my stress has any finite value, 1 megapascal, even then I will get this part and I will get that part. That part will be very, very small, but still I will get it. Right? So there will always be some amount of plasticity. It will never be zero. It can be very, 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 very small, but it will never be zero. <coughs> okay? Another important thing about this equation is you always get one value of. So for one value of strain, you always have one value of stress. Or for one value of stress, you always have one value of strain. What does that mean? That this equation cannot define unloading. Okay? So if I unload it from here, so at 
one value of stress, I have two different values of strain. Am I getting two different values of strain from that equation? No. Right? So that equation is only describing this part. And this is called deformation plasticity. Okay? <clears throat> and based on this deformation plasticity, this equation, which is also called Ramberg Oswood equation. We will define a line integral later on when we talk about fracture mechanics. Okay? So until then, you should remember this when we are in fracture mechanics. And we will use the speciality of this equation that for any value of stress, you get one value of strain and vice versa. And it follows the same path. Whether or not you are loading it or unloading it, it will always fall on this curve. Always. Right? No, no, you are not assuming. You put any value of stress, the point of strain will always fall on this curve. According to its equation. Yes. So the equation comes in the form that it always is on that curve. So basically, we are defining that equation, that curve with that equation. Okay? So we are not defining any unloading. We cannot define any unloading using one equation, can we? We can't. Okay? So in order to really model something, so when we, let us say, model using finite element method or analytically, then for instance, let us talk a little bit about crash also. So suppose I have a crack in a body, okay? And then I apply some force on it or some displacement on it, and this crack will cross the material's resistance after some time, material will initially resist by consuming the energy in the form of plastic deformation. And when that is done, then material cannot sustain the force because you, have, you keep on increasing the force or displacement, okay? <clears throat> so in that case, there will be a deformed zone. And after that, the material will separate. It will start separating, right? So the extra amount of energy is coming. That extra amount of energy is needed for creation of two surfaces. And that energy is coming by the mechanical energy which you are putting into the system in the form of force or displacement. So the crack will propagate. Okay? So initially, you take some points here. And these material points are connected. Right? They are connected. They are in continuum. They have a force on it. They have a stress on it. In response to that, they have a strain on it. Once the crack has propagated and it has separated, now these two points have no force on it. They will become the part of either of the surface, on the upper side or the lower side. Right? So what has happened to those points? All the points in the body, when we model, we will put an equation to it for a stress strain calculation. Okay? So let us say we put Ramberg Oxford equation. Okay, so whenever there is a strain, the stress will be calculated using that equation. <clears throat> so all of the points will follow this stress strain diagram. Well, not this stress strain diagram, but this stress strain diagram, two stress strain diagram. Okay, and when the stress goes to zero, what will happen? There will be no stress, no strain on the point. So it is getting unloaded. It means those points are getting unloaded. Okay? So the argument which is made to apply this equation is, this equation is good as long as you are loading the sample. You shouldn't unload and then you are good to go. But in certain scenarios, you cannot avoid unloading. Such as this. Okay? So, in this case, you cannot apply this kind of equation, and that we will deal <coughs> later with that problem. <clears throat> so, 
go to define a criteria for plastic deformation, what we can think of? We can think of that hydrostatic stresses will not contribute to plasticity, right? And we know that the function which can be used for plasticity must be a function of the principal stresses. <coughs> okay. Apart from that, we can also say that the first invariant of that equation is not going to give any plasticity. Okay. <coughs> so, only second and third invariant should be defining plasticity. Okay. And these invariants are of the deviatory stress. Okay not from the real stress tension. So J2 we have seen, J3 we have seen, and based on these uh, hit and trial and some signature from the real experiment, people have created yield criteria, and some of the criteria you might know, one is von Mises criteria, another is Kurska criteria, okay? So what is von Mises criteria? One Mises criteria says that the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor must be equal to some constant. And when, so that's a critical value. And whenever that critical value is crossed, yielding will begin. Okay? So what is J2? J2 is 1 by 6, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 whole square. that should be equal to some, some constant. I could have written k, I'm writing k square because I will have squares on both sides. <clears throat> okay. How do we find out the value of k? So we can take an example of uniaxial stress condition or uniaxial tensile testing. So in that case, my principal stress, I say that the other two stresses are zero and I only have sigma one. Okay. So if I have that, then sigma 1 is equal to sigma naught, will be equal to sigma naught when yielding happens. Okay? So this will become sigma naught square, this will be 0, this will be sigma naught square. So I will have 2 sigma naught square divided by 6, I will have 1 by 3 sigma naught square. Okay? So 1 by 3 sigma naught square is equal to k square. So k I can find out to be how much? k is equal to? Or sigma naught is equal to how much? Root 3k. Sigma naught is equal to root 3 into k. Or k is equal to sigma naught by root 3. Okay? <coughs> so now we have a combination. So some constant, 1 by 6. Instead of 1 by 6, I will have some other constant that multiplied by the summation of the differences of principal stress. And why differences of principal stress? That you should understand better. Every difference in two principal stress will be giving you a shear stress. So it's a combination of shear stress. Okay. <clears throat> so the advantage of this over Tresca is, so Tresca basically takes only the maximum principal stress and minimum principal stress and that should be defining the yield strength. This is Tresca criteria that is one Mises criteria. Okay? So Tresca is making a logic. Tresca is saying that the middle value has no meaning. Right? Because the maximum shear stress will always be between the maximum principle and minimum principle. And wherever that maximum shear stress is, plasticity is going to begin there only. 
it will not begin to those areas where you have the shear stresses which are not maximum right worst condition may plasticity shuru hoga koi bhi event shuru hoga okay so that's the different point and have you done in tutorial have you discussed the uh, biaxial condition and the ellipse which it makes no not yet sir not yet okay so if you if you make it biaxial saying that let us say sigma 2 is 0 okay then what will you have you will have what sigma 1 squared plus sigma 3 squared plus or minus you will have minus sigma 1 sigma 3 is equal to some constant into sigma naught four. right and this represents an equation of an ellipse and when you draw it over sigma 1 and sigma 3 then this will have an origin center at the origin and it will have a major sorry minor and a major axis and you will have this kind of curve for von Mises criteria and the meaning of this is whenever the stress conditions are on this line then they are plastically deforming whenever the stress point so you take any point which has a value of sigma 1 comma sigma 3 and this point is inside this ellipse they are deforming elastically okay so fine we have defined our first point of plasticity here and that is represented by that ellipse what will happen if my stress point is here? Will it lie outside the ellipse? If I have a point there, which is beyond V stress, will it lie outside the ellipse? At the boundary. Sir. At the boundary, but that boundary is describing sigma naught right now. So how will it be on the boundary my equivalent stress is now more than sigma naught right so how will it remain on that ellipse so again will it be on the ellipse or it will be outside the ellipse. Okay. Outside sir. No. It will be on the ellipse. But can you tell me how? Because after yielding at every point this ellipse must be redefined. Okay. So always your so so in this calculation every time the value of sigma naught is changing but then there is a problem that what will happen to this point then because that will lie inside the ellipse so will it that be deforming elastically How? Will that point be lying inside the ellipse or outside the ellipse or on the ellipse? Inside the so inside by definition should be elastic. Isn't it? Every material point is always at one state of stress. It cannot have more than one state of stress. 
Do you understand? So at every so if I am modeling a tensile specimen, any point will always at one state of state, right? So either it is plastically deforming or it is not. Both of them cannot be correct. So when it is plastically deforming, it will be so. The meaning of that is it will always be having one point which will be describing the state of stress on any material point. <clears throat> okay, so it doesn't have two different, but at two different locations you will have two different yield surfaces. Okay, so in three dimension when you have three principal stresses. Then this ellipse looks like a cylinder. And then the surface of this cylinder is the yield surface. Okay? And along the axis, we what do we have along the axis? What is changing? If we shift along the axis, what is changing? Principal stresses are changing. Normal stresses are changing. Okay? So only hydrostatic component of stress is changing. Okay? And whenever the deviatoric stress is changing, this surface will increase or decrease. Okay? So that's the meaning of the yield surface. Okay? So now let us look at some other types of stress strain behavior. So sometimes we can have this type of behavior in a stress strain diagram. So we can have serrations, oscillations. Can you tell me what could be the reasons we have this kind of behavior? Why a stress strain diagram will look like this? So this kind of stress strain diagram is called homogeneous elastic heterogeneous plastic. So why do we have this kind of behavior? And another type of stress strain curve we can have which will look like this. So tell me why, what could be the reason for such behavior in such kind of area? Why will that cause oscillation? Why the stress is increasing and then decreasing, and then increasing, and then decreasing, again and again? Because of movement of the stress. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good, good. That's the correct answer actually. So dislocations are moving and they are being intersected by themselves also. That happens in normal fields also. Okay. But there you don't see this kind of behavior in the stress strain diagram. Only in certain cases you see this. Why? So there are some known reasons for this and a special case is what is known as yield point phenomena. That's a special case which happens because of interstitials locking the dislocation and it doesn't happen by substitutional atom because interstitials are like bikes, motor bikes on the road. Okay, so they can also go on footpath and kill someone and <laughs> move ahead. So they have a very high diffusion uh, coefficient. Their diffusivity is good. So what they do is they will lock the dislocation and then a very small amount of energy is available so they will again go leave the dislocation there. So now dislocation will not need much stress to get unlocked. Okay, so now it can move, so stress decreases. Then they will lock again. Okay, and this will go on like a, 
rat and cat prey. That is called dynamic strain agent. And this happens when you add, so you have very small amount of carbon in the system and <clears throat> it happens at higher temperature, a little higher temperature, room temperature it will not show this, but at elevated temperature you can have this kind of strain behavior. Okay. Apart from that, this can also happen when you have martensite transformation in the tree. So, martensite, I don't know how much do you know about martensite. Martensite is what? What is martensite? Have you heard of martensite? Yes, sir. What is it? Sir, interstitial solid solution of iron in. Uh, interstitial solid solution of iron? Uh, alpha iron in uh, uh, carbon cycle. In cement type. In cement type? Koi of this, you know what is martensite? Yes, sir. Sir, so when we are uh, cooling our steel yeah. uh, at a very high rate, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, carbon doesn't diffuse and uh, uh, get trapped in iron. Yeah. Uh, due to martensite uh, get formed. Martensite. Iron is trapped and then what forms? It is known as martensite. Yeah. Sir, needle like this, sir. Sir, yes. critical uh, cooling rate should be greater than the critical cooling rate. Yes. Then only we get martensite. So we are talking about a culprit. Okay. He can be found. What you are describing is that he can be found in UP and Uttarakhand. Okay. And when you do a lot of policing, you might catch him. And you are defining that he does this kind of robberies and these kind of crimes, modus operandi you are defining. But what is Bartonite? What is the crystal structure of Bartonite? Yes, sir. Good. And, and what is, how does it differ from, let's say, perlite, ferrite, austenite, apart from crystal structure, does it differ in any other way? Why do you need to have a higher critical cooling rate to make it? What will happen if I cool it very fast? Will it form martensite? What is the speed of formation of martensite? How much time do you need to make it? Sir, at very fast cooling rate, uh, martensite. Uh not found on the inside of the material. Why? Only on the surface only. At a very high cooling rate? Yes, sir. Why it will not form inside the material? Because sir, their uh, temperature will be, temperature gradient will So, be cooling rate will be slower inside? Yes, sir. At the surface, it will be maximum. That's yes, the practical situation you are telling. Yes, sir. But suppose, hypothetically, I achieve a cooling rate of 10 to the power 6 per Kelvin. Okay? So, what he is describing is this temperature transformation curve, okay? So here you have temperature and what do you have here? Time. Time. Okay? So you begin with austenite and then it forms whatever and then it forms whatever. So alpha iron, okay? So I suppose you are, are you getting it? No. No? Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. So, it do you know about phase diagram? Yeah? Okay. So, when you have carbon in iron, then we call it phase. Yeah? We can put a lot of alloying elements, but it's not that plain also. If you put a lot of carbon, we don't call it phase. Then we call it cast iron. Okay? So, steel is an alloy of iron. And we have a lot of alloying elements in it. And at a higher temperature, the phase diagram looks like this. So we have FCC iron here, phase centered cubic. That is called austenite. Okay? And this axis is temperature. This is a normal phase diagram, the lower part of it. And this is percentage of carbon. Okay? So when you cool it down, then if you are here, then a little bit of austenite will transform into what is known as ferrite, which is BCC, which is represented as alpha. 
so alpha iron is having body centered series structure okay so that's the difference between alpha and gamma fcc bcc so some of the grains and all of them are solids that's why we have crystal structure so some of the grains are transforming to alpha and then if you go further down then what will happen this will form perlite a little bit of austenite will remain or it will transform to cementite okay and then you will have alpha and perlite is another structure which is a combination of alpha and a carbide why it is forming carbide because fcc can accommodate more amount of carbon in it it has higher solubility we know that whenever we decrease temperature solubility decreases also diffusivity decreases okay so it is not stable it is not possible for austenite to keep more carbon in it okay so it is becoming unstable so now it is changing to bcc or what it can do is it can take some carbon and make a carbide and then make a different crystal structure and dissociate from the system okay so this transformation has a kinetic this transformation takes some time so suppose all my material was austenite and all of that has to change to alpha or alpha plus perlite okay so i'm going from a to b so this a to b will take some time and it will also take temperature drop those are there will be driving forces because of cooling okay so this curve describes that only okay so at any particular temperature when you give a lot of time then they transform to a different crystal structure to a different phases okay so you can also cool it so you can for example if you are here then you can cool it and leave it do you understand so if i am here let us say and i cool it and obviously when i cool i will take some time so it will go like this also okay so when i cool it if i am here and if i cool it very fast or if i am here and if i just leave it like that so here i am going to take a lot of time for transformation when i cool it very fast i am going to take less time for transformation and so on okay but if i cool it so that it never touches this transformation curve then this transformation is not going to happen do you follow so this phase fcc will never transform to alpha ever if your cooling rate is so fast that it is not touching the curve okay and i am saying that what if i cool it very very fast very very fast then what will happen so fine if if i am cooling it faster than this curve then it will form martensite agreed what if i cool it very fast what if i cool a solid which forms a crystal and i cool it very fast what will happen what will happen so can see for that is the process depending so <laughs> what will happen to the material in what phase in what form will it be and the question is a little uh, so the previous question is not correct let me correct the question i am cooling it from liquid phase not from austenite from austenite i cannot cool it very fast because it is very solid so but from liquid i just freeze it now you should have an answer sir it will not get the time to yeah yeah all those things are done then what will be the end product so amorphous yes i am freezing the liquid so all the atoms are there and they are not in a particular order so it will form a glass this we call metallic glass okay so the signature of martensite i don't know why i am thinking martensite the signature of martensite is it forms very fast the formation the transformation rate is of the speed of sound okay and it's a super saturated solid solution of carbon and iron 
that is one example of martensite which forms in iron carbon system but martensite is a general term okay there are other martensites which form in iron nickel system and they are not super saturated solid solution that is in mar aging steel okay so martensite is a phase which forms not by diffusion it's not a diffusive transformation from liquid to solid when any crystal has to form the atom has to go to certain places and they have to arrange themselves in some order they have done it in fcc so from fcc now you are changing to bcc so the atoms have to move and find a new location so they will not suddenly change in bcc right they need to diffuse and go to that location some of them are transformed to bcc some of them are still in fcc here okay so what will happen so suppose i have one location where alpha has formed and the next one is gamma so this alpha now will grow by add on to the surface one by one the atoms will set and they will increase the size of bcc that is happening by diffusion diffusion is a function of both time and temperature okay that's why if you give a lot of time it will happen if you give a lot of temperature drop also it will happen so it's but if you cool it very fast diffusion is very sluggish so it cannot happen so fcc is trying to become bcc it cannot become so it stops midway become bcc and becomes entrapped carbon in the system which is martensite okay but martensite formation can happen only after a temperature is achieved only if you cool it to a certain temperature then it will form only if you attain a cooling a cooling rate fast enough then only it will form okay so <clears throat> one of the criteria for formation of martensite is that it needs a lot of it needs to have a lot of deformation in it okay it cannot form it's a displacive transformation it doesn't form by diffusion it forms by deformation okay and that deformation the crystal attains by itself because of drop in temperature okay that's why if you all those who are metallurgists if you look at the habit planes of martensite it's not integers okay so it's 120 1 11 something like that so if you convert in miller indices it will be 1 1 by 21 1 by 11 that's not a real plane that's an average plane of all the twinning which is happening in the martensite okay so these martensite transformation phenomena from austenite to a phase which is not stable which is unstable you make it stable by non equilibrium condition is martensite and this transformation can happen in many materials okay and in many materials this transformation can happen by the application of stress if you deform it the the phase will change to martensite if you take the load away it will come back to austenite iska use kya hai agar aisa kiya to kya use kar sakte hain iska shape memory alloy okay in shape memory alloy and one particular famous example is niti nickel titanium where you apply stress and it will change its shape why because there is a phase transformation happening and because of that there will be changes in volume and that will be causing the shape change and when you take the load away it will come back to its original shape so it remembers why it remembers because there is a transformation in this phase okay that phenomena can also happen in steel okay so when we apply stress and in our system we have retained austenite i have wiped out that diagram but some of the austenite couldn't transform to ferrite it remained at room temperature but it is not stable it doesn't belong at room temperature right it's a phase which belongs to a higher temperature so at room temperature it has been trapped okay when you apply stress it gets the sufficient amount of energy to transform and that is called deformed martensite 
and when that martensite transformation happens that increases stress okay and then you will have more martensite transformation because you have packets of retained austenite here and there and that's why you will get this serration in the stress strain curve and sometimes you can also hear the sound of martensite transformation when you are loading it when you are doing the tensile test and it can transform during the tensile test you can also hear it okay this is called pin cry okay so because of those reasons dsa martensitic transformation also sometimes if you have very high strain if you are deforming at a very high speed you can have oscillations and stress strain curve okay and now coming to this stress strain curve first tell me this stress strain curve belongs to which type of material ye kya metallic material mein aisa hota hai aisa dekha hai stress strain to ye kin kaun sa material hai polymers yeah so now tell me why the stress strain diagram looks like this what happens in polymer how does plastic deformation happens in polymer पॉलीमर क्रिस्टलाइन होता है कि नहीं होता है क्या होता है हमेशा पॉली क्रिस्टलाइन में क्रिस्टलाइन होता है सो व्हाट काइंड ऑफ क्रिस्टल स्ट्रक्चर इट हैज बोलो नाइलॉन रबर क्या होता है उसमें टायर क्या होता है what is the structure of polymer polymer mein kya hota hai you know i are kuch to as a general general knowledge question what is there in polymer inside the polymer what is there in the steel inside iron hai carbon hai so polymer mein kya hota hai na mata कार्बन 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 बॉन्ड समटाइम सिंगल समटाइम डबल राइट एंड यू हैव इधर हाइड्रोजन और सम अदर आयन व्हिच आर अटैच्ड टू इट राइट सो इफ आई ओनली हैव हाइड्रोजन 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 देन इट कैन हैव ओनली वन स्ट्रक्चर क्योंकि ये तो सिमेट्रिक हो गया इसके पास हाइड्रोजन ही है है ना तो थ्री डायमेंशन में इट विल मेक एन एंगल बिटवीन थ्री हाइड्रोजन एटम्स एंड दैट एंगल विल नेवर चेंज व्हाट इफ आई हैव दिस और आई हैव अ बेंजीन हियर देन व्हाट विल हैपन सो आई हैव अ बेंजीन एंड हाइड्रोजन आल्सो देन व्हाट विल हैपन देन इट विल हैव टू चेंज इट्स एंगल राइट सो आई हैव अनदर बेंजीन सो आई हैव टू पुट अनदर बेंजीन अनदर बेंजीन एंड सो ऑन so now you see if i only have hydrogen hydrogen i don't have many permutation combinations to do but if i have benzene i can put a benzene down on this side and hydrogen then a benzene here and so on so 1 0 that kind of arrangement i can do that will be more suitable because it has to maintain some distance with the bigger molecules right so these chains will try to achieve different angles to minimize their energy which is called steric hindrance and you can have 1 0 1 type of arrangement you can have all the benzenes on the upper side all the hydrogen on the lower side a little high energy uh, situation and what should be the third type uh, no no <laughs> half above half below will be in 1 0 1 0 hai na 
बेंजीन हाइड्रोजन बेंजीन हाइड्रोजन तो हाफ ऊपर है हाफ नीचे है ना तो यू वांट टू पुट ऑल द बेंजीन ऑन द हाफ ऑफ द चेन अपर साइड एंड ऑल द बेंजीन ऑन द हाफ ऑफ द चेन लोअर साइड सी सॉ काइंड ऑफ थिंग ना दैट डजंट हैपन कुड वेल कुड हैपन आई एम नॉट सो श्योर द थर्ड पॉसिबिलिटी इज रैंडम कोई कहीं भी बैठ गया वो तब होगा जब हम ज्यादा टाइम नहीं लेंगे ओके so based on so you have three types of arrangement possible and then these chains can become longer very longer polymer matlab kya ek monomer liya usme add on kiya ab kitna add on karein that is so to my wish right so i can have a chain of 1000 carbon atoms i can have a chain of 100 carbon atoms 10 carbon atoms so long chains are possible now these chains how they will arrange themselves अब इसका मेरे को ये दस्तर बनाना है सो दीज चेन ऑल ऑफ दम अगर मैं एक चेन को ऐसे लंबा लटका दू तो तो उसका दस्तर नहीं बनेगा राइट सो इफ आई हैव टू मेक इट आई कैन जस्ट पुट इट असेंबल इट और रख सकते हैं राइट और इफ आई हैव लॉट ऑफ टाइम इन द वर्ल्ड देन आई कैन पुट देम वेरी नाइसली लाइक दिस Or if I can just wind it on my finger, <coughs> like earphones, which are gone now. Why earphones are gone? वो wire वाला earphone अभी इसको ही use नहीं कर सकते हैं। Earpods comfort. कैसा comfort? वो खराब हो तार खराब हो जाती है। तार क्यों खराब हो जाती है? Handling weak. उसमें strain आ रहा है। एक problem उसकी ये थी। कि दोज इयर फोन यू कीप इट इन पॉकेट नाइसली डन एंड वेन यू टेक इट आउट दे आर नॉट नाइसली डन ओके सो दैट इज अ मैथमेटिकल प्रॉब्लम तुम उसको जितना भी सुलझा के रखते हो वो एक नॉट बना देता है एंड समटाइम्स दो नॉट आर नॉट पॉसिबल बिकॉज यू हैव टू पुट समथिंग इन साइड एंड देन इन साइड एंड देन यू हैव इट बट स्टिल दे मेक इट दे मेक द नॉट राइट देर आर सम जीन्स in our molecules when a cell is divided then you have to break the chromosome right telomere hota hai usko kaat deta hai har bar telomere chota ho jata hai telomere is the end on the on the chain of dna rna right jo bhi protein hai uska end ka chain ko telomere bolte hain har bar wo chain jab katti hai telomere chota hota jata hai aur jab wo ekdam se chota hota hai tab hum log upar chale jate hain kaam khatam ho jata hai so a lot of research is being done how to reduce the reduction in telomere okay so whenever these long chain and these long chains are sometimes meters long inside our body okay and it these things are getting divided so what are the possibilities that these chains will entangle with each other wo aapas mein band jayega knot ho jayega phans jayega tab kaise hoga so there are some proteins which go and they separate the chain and some proteins will then count it measure it and separate it put it in two different cells if that doesn't happen you will have a lot of disease okay so 90% of the times these genes they perform well sometimes they don't and that's when you have weird disease that's when you can have cancer that's when you can have different other diseases mutations local mutations which can be taken care of <coughs> cannot be taken care of okay so polymers also arrange themselves in this particular fashion or this particular fashion or sometimes they are just there aise hi pada hua hai okay so a polymer can have a structure where you have small areas where they are very nicely coiled with each other and then a lot of spaces where they are randomly fitted and a lot of chains are there it's not one chain okay a lot of chains are binded together okay you can have cross linked you can have not cross linked all those kind of possibilities are there when you load the system what will happen first 
these open chains will pass open up. Okay? Kula hua rasi jab anchor dalenge pani ke andar, to jitna rasi kula utta chala jayega. Uske baad jo winding hai, wo dhire dhire khulegi. Right? So these are called plastides. They are small packets. Crystallized, sorry. They are called crystallized. They are small packets. Okay? And they are in order. That's why they are called crystallized. So when we talk about crystallized polymer or a polymer which is also amorphous, also, also crystalline, we are not talking about those crystal structures which we have read off. We are not talking about BCC, FCC and all those. We are talking about an area which is ordered. That's a crystal, right? It's an area which is ordered or a volume which is ordered. So first they will open up. They have opened up. Okay? When you unload it, they can go back. But once these crystallites have opened up, they might not crystallite again. Now do you feel what is elastic and plastic deformation in case of polymer? And when all the ropes will be undone, then the load will come to each rope. Okay? And each rope, each chain, will only then at the end, first all the winding has to open up. And only then you will see this when you pull a rubber, you will see small fragments coming out from the surface. You will also see change in temperature. If you touch it, touch it with your tongue, you will feel it. Turant effect kolo or deep temperature change. Color will change. A red rubber will look whitish. Okay. When the load comes to the chain, these chains have very high energy in comparison to metallic metal. In metals, we have metallic bonds. Here we have covalent bonds. Okay? So that's why this stress goes very high when it comes to all the fibers have aligned themselves in the direction of the force. Then the load is now borne by each chain and that chain has to break. Only then it will break the stress. Okay? So then we're finished. So this class, a question here to people. Uh, so tomorrow, Wednesday, 